The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Cyber Reason webinar on the MitraTAC framework and the, um, the exciting results of the Cyber Reason assessment. Um, first of all, quick apology. Uh, we know this webinar was meant to be a couple of days ago, uh, but we had a technical issue with our webinar platform, which we were not able to fix in time. So uh, for those of you that have been able to join us at what is pretty short notice, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we would love to have your questions. Um, there is a menu pick uh, in the panel on the right of your screens. Uh, as we go through the content today, just message your questions and we will address as many of them as possible at the end of the session. So let's now move on. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sam Curry, uh, who is uh, Cyber Reason's uh, Chief uh, Security Officer, who will now take you through today's content. Uh, before I hand you over, um, something I was going to mention, Sam has uh, just received SC Magazine's award uh, for being one of the security industry's greatest visionaries in the last 30 years, and he is one of only five people that were awarded this. So Sam, congratulations on receiving that reward, uh, or that award rather. And um, now I will pass over to you. Thank you, Alistair. That's very kind. Um, uh, so yes, as Alistair mentioned, uh, my name is Sam, uh, Sam Curry, and I'm the Chief Security Officer for Cyber Reason. Um, my background, um, I, I for, a, for a while, did a couple of startups, um, but I held senior positions at McAfee and at Computer Associates and RSA and Arbor Networks, uh, now part of Netscout. Um, and I also ran RSA Labs uh, for a few years on the uh, more academic side. Um, so today we're going to cover uh, the MITRE ATT&CK evaluations. ATT&CK is a framework that uh, MITRE has put out. In particular, I'm, gonna, I'm going to dive into what they are, how to use them, uh, and I mean much more than in a vendor sense, and um, Cyber Reason's results I'll share as well. And, um, and there are a few places where I'm going to dive into as tangible an examination of any of the findings in the attack evaluations um, in a generic sense, but I, I will use uh, some simple screenshots from our own tool at Cyber Reason. Um, all the companies in the space have have uh, great technology. Um, I'm just using ours because that's the one I, I know how to use best. <clears throat> so having said that, um, I draw a distinction in security between IT security and cybersecurity. Um, I find the, the term cyber has evolved a lot over the years and can be confusing to many. Um, but I think of IT security as things that, that don't necessarily require beyond policy setting any special security knowledge um, and can be handily managed by the IT department. Things that, things like antivirus and firewalls and password resets and patching, um, these are largely technical things, but not necessarily security things. And I manage them in my infrastructure differently than I do cyber things. Um, so the analogy, an analogy that I sometimes use is in medicine, um, I, I think of IT security uh, as equivalent to uh, the hygiene in a hospital and in an operating room, uh, the actual cleanliness of the room, the power supply, the drugs, the um, having the right equipment on hand, the redundancy in power, the right temperature. These things save lives. If you if you if you think about um, if you think about uh, any medical drama or any medical uh, issues, we know that that sterilization and taking care of germs and making sure that the right conditions exist, especially temperature these days. Interestingly, that saves lives, but it doesn't require special uh, medical knowledge once it's known, it could be operationalized. The cyber is the equivalent though of the doctors and nurses in the processes that they use. And, and really that forms the difference between a morgue and an operating room. If you had an emergency surgery to perform like an, like an appendectomy, <clears throat> you, you probably wouldn't wanna be put in a room without a doctor in it. Now it wouldn't be fun, but you could probably have it done impromptu with a doctor and have a better chance of surviving even in a non-sterile environment. It's not an either or situation, but the two do need to be managed differently. Um, however, I also wanna make another distinction which goes a bit beyond the simple uh, analogy, which is um, or the, the notion of chaotic systems. Uh, there are two flavors of chaotic systems. The, the first order chaos systems are things like the weather. How you behave doesn't affect where the weather will go. Where you take shelter doesn't affect where uh, a nasty storm will go. 
Um, <clears throat> and then when you deal with these sorts of things, what you do is you, you try to reduce the likelihood something will happen and reduce the impact. But second order chaos systems respond to how you behave. Meaning if you, you take the police, for instance, where you put police officers in a city affects where violent crime happens, where the muggings happen, where the robberies happen. And most, <clears throat> most cyber risk, as opposed to IT security risk, is actually dealing with an intelligent opponent. Now, an argument could be made for if you could bring more notion of how the bad guys move and, and shift through an environment, you could do things like triage around patching. And I would say at that point, that would graduate to be treated as cyber risk. Now, both matter, but differently from one another. And you have to manage both differently. And building on that, um, there's this notion of uh, prevention. Um, you've probably heard the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's always true. Um, and I think we should always prevent the preventable. Um, however, if I draw another simpler medical analogy, imagine if we all know that it's better to be healthy to, um, ahead of time and to uh, manage weight and to exercise and to have good sleep hygiene in our lives. Um, but I don't think any, any government would seriously consider moving funds entirely out of the emergency rooms and shutting them down in favor of public um, you know, preventative med medicine to the exclusion of not having any um, ability to deal with things that might happen. And the reason is because bad things still happen. And so I just wanted to, to make sure that um, when you're thinking about what we're discussing here, you realize it's detection. And I, in fact, like the term detection and response, meaning you have preventative controls like a perimeter, antivirus, you know, um, strong authentication, um, the, the patching I mentioned earlier, you have these controls in the environment, even physical, physical security, but with an intelligent adaptive opponent, they're going to get past them. And it's our job to not just detect them, if you know, that's what we, the, the nomenclature generally refers this to, but to, to detect them and to wrap it up and to remove the risk associated with that. Um, there's a, a, in the military, there's this notion of uh, an OODA loop. It stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. And this is directly applicable. Observe is the equivalent of detection. Orientation and deciding is what you do is you investigate and understand the impact and make sure you've got the full scope of it. In fact, you might iterate here a bit and then you decide on the actions to take. The acting actually is usually pretty quick um, and you can reflexively get good at that. I'm reminded of, an, an, um, of a, a gunfighting in your head if you picture two cowboys facing each other in the street and one has his gun out. Um, the other one has um, his or her gun in their holster. Um, we mentally, Hollywood has trained us for this, think that the one with the gun out wins. However, statistically, the, in gunfights, the one with the gun that isn't drawn wins, um, which may sound counterintuitive, but this explains a lot of reasons why people sometimes shoot first. Uh, aside from lack of training, the very trained sometimes do as well. Because when the gun is out, you're not in the beginning of an OODA loop. The person with the gun in their holster will pull the gun and they begin, and the action takes very little time. They've gone through the observe, the orient, and the decide, and they've pulled the gun out. And this is equivalent to what we have to do inside companies. We have to wrap up these conflicts very quickly. This is massively disruptive to the endpoint protection market, as we've known it, um, and the whole detection space, in particular EDR tools, or endpoint detection and response. But so far, it's been an art. Now, there are people who very scientifically have approached computer science and are very good at what they do um, when they're actually doing the analyst job. But the way of handling from initial incursion, in other words, that which gets past prevention, to catch them through a kill chain and then wrap it up at the end in a systematic way with a taxonomy has been very poorly done to date. In fact, the term kill chain from Lockheed Martin was one of the few attempts at this, and it hasn't really been advanced very much since in the public domain. Um, so where do we turn to find out what are the things that can help us prevent, uh, sorry, rather detect and then to respond? Well, there's been three approaches to date. Um, the first is this notion of private labs. These are people that don't share their methodology. They hide behind a journalism type of, of um, veneer. And they tend to take money from both sides. This doesn't leave people feeling very well. Um, and everyone has to pay you know, lots of money on both sides. Um, both those that produce products and those that consume them without really understanding much of what goes on in between. And then there are the public tests. Uh, we've seen these in antivirus for years. The public tests themselves, very ethical, but the bar is unusual. Most of the threats that are tested for are five, six weeks old or older. 
Um, and you see everyone bragging about 98 to 100% results. Well, that's not, that's not the problem. No one is complaining about how prevention does with the preventable. What we really want to know is how do they do with the not preventable? How are you finding the, the thing that you couldn't stop at the perimeter? How are you finding that after it gets past the perimeter? And that, that, that is what's essentially missing in many of these tests. And then you, you might be tempted to say, well, what about the analysts? What about the, the Gartners and Foresters of the world, who are fantastic companies, by the way, in many ways, but they don't do firsthand research anymore. Most of them, in, in respectively, in their magic quadrants and waves, um, they actually they rely on the first two categories, generally say that a vendor, in order to be in their testing, has to have been through the first two if testing exists. And the thing that they solve is how to reduce an RFP shortlist or how to make a purchasing decision in a way that isn't going to lead to someone being fired. And underlying all of this is always this desire by the public to come up with a simplistic sports score, um, mostly driving a lot of dollars in the industry, both for purchases and for VCs and so on. So um, I'd like to remind you guys that this is not about product, any product. When you hear um, testing of these third-party products, we tend to lionize the technology. We tend to look for the one new rack mountable solution that once plugged in place will stop everything. The goal is, in fact, to get business results. That means to more reliably, more predictably, and in an improving fashion, then catch more, faster, and more completely. And to, you know, the goal that we all have is to enjoy the expectation of detection early and fast, and ideally even predictively, and change the nature of prevention. But as long as we have this intelligent opponent, then nothing static can stop it. No machine, no matter what the hyperbole of the marketing terms, no no wonderful machine learning and artificial intelligence, both of which I think are, are vital to doing this correctly, they aren't going to solve it. We haven't yet solved the Turing challenge of having a human-like intelligence living in the system, able to behave on our behalf. Instead, we have to get to a point where we have assisted humans, those that are bulked by automation, machine learning, and sometimes artificial intelligence, in order to be efficient at finding these things. And that's the trick. There is no what I call spog, a single pane of glass. There is no magic analytic solution. And there's no avoiding being healthy at cyber. We have to get good at the act of running these things to ground. And that means it's going to be a combination of people, and I mean plural, not just security people, but also the people around us who are going to help coordinate response and take action, collaborating efficiently in many departments and processes, plural, including the strategy management and retrospective analysis of how those processes are working and, and tightening them to remove waste. And yes, then it includes technology as well. So <clears throat> it's at this point we can get into the MITRE attack framework. It is built, first of all, MITRE is a not-for-profit organization that um, originally serviced uh, the U.S. government. Um, I, I, they went for a long time with building the attack framework, only doing things for the government before they decided last year to go public. And um, uh, colleagues of mine that I met with in the testing industry said, um, you know, quite complimentary, they said they've improved the body of knowledge generally that we all base what we do on. Meaning the, the three, the three um, examples of third party validation that I had earlier can be done better and more efficiently now because this is out there, which is encouraging. So there's no mafia issues, there's no doping issues, there's no analyst bias. Josh Zalonis, the forester, by the way, in fact said you can't fool attack. And quite rightly, um, it isn't designed to say, let's get to a one-to-end sports score. Instead, it reveals a lot about your design philosophy, your architecture. And most importantly, as a vendor, it, 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 it says, here's what you can do to plug this into a program. And you can also apply these, the exact same framework to analyze a program and say, how are we doing operationally? So it's built around real advanced attack methodologies. It's not a wild list. There's no massively old viruses. It's, it is built around a, a kill chain. Um, I, now, the, the original kill chain from Lockheed Martin had seven stages. This one has 11, as you'll see in a minute. We, we refer to that at side reason as a malop or a malicious operation. Uh, it's effectively the same thing. Um, <clears throat> it's also nuanced to help security programs as job one. It was originally designed to help the US government do the job of security. And it means that means that it can do it for you as well. Testing of vendors is long, difficult, but also fair. And what others do downstream with this, um, that's all up to them. And I should mention as well, if you go to the MITRE uh, website, it's, it's attack.mitre.org, 
you will find a library of attacks that they're building out. So you can run these tests yourself and you can use the framework to then analyze how you behave. Forget the vendors, you can do that with your own organization. So uh, round one, and I refer to round one as what has just completed, had nine vendors in it. It simulated a real world scenario. So, and, and the attacker, they used two campaigns from APT3. Um, it was not what I call atomic. Atomic means um, you could think of it as a checklist. So you run a hash, did it find the hash? Yes, no. You run an exploit, did it find the exploit? Yes, no. And, but it was focused on detections and it was focused on chains of detections. So it allowed the entire attack to play out step by step. It covers a subset of attack. Now attack, if you picture in your mind, um, a timeline representing the kill chain, um, you could think of stages along that kill chain as, or categories of attacks as what they call tactics. That's their terminology. There are 11 tactics in total, 10 were tested in this test. And in each tactic, they are stacked under them are, you can think of boxes in your head, uh, are techniques used by APT3 in this case. Um, of the total 223 techniques that, uh, that MITRE is aware of, they tested 56 here. And again, there were no scores, rankings, or qualifiers out of this. And what I'm going to now dive into is what the actual scoring tags were and could be, and then I'll show you some examples of these. So the first thing you could have is you could have an empty box for a technique. It could be nothing, and that's not a good thing. It means that whatever technology you're using, in this case, they tested EDR tools, uh, didn't find anything for a given technique. The next is telemetry. And telemetry is actually very important. It's not ideal as a detection mechanism, but it's critical for investigation and hunting. Telemetry means there is data about this. It wasn't necessarily brought to someone's attention, but if somebody were to try to follow the breadcrumb trail, the information would be there for them to reconstruct what happened. So telemetry isn't, isn't, isn't fantastic, but it's ideal and, and very, very useful in hunting scenarios and investigation. Indicator of compromise means there was a known bad flag thrown. And essentially um, it said, this is malware. This is a URL that's bad. This is a, a, a thing that is known to the public has been caught. Enrichment, enrichment is very important. It says context is brought to a particular technique that's been flagged and um, helps the analyst decide what the, what the importance of something is to make a business decision, um, perhaps to continue thinking about in their head, uh, on paper with their colleagues, um, building a case and, and doing an investigation. And then you get general behavior, which is a detection that says this is bad because it's following a type and specific behavior, which narrows in with a very, very low chance of false positive and says, this one's bad, it is attack X, it is attack Y, it is cobalt strike, for instance. Um, there are also three modifier detection types. Um, the first is, is delayed. Uh, I'm not a big fan of delayed. There are two flavors of this. The first is uh, perhaps you have an offline batch process or a statistical analysis or a correlation engine that um, will do its thing in crunch and then come back in not real time and say, this particular technique has been found. The second flavor of delayed is a mechanical Turk. Somebody behind the scenes has, um, has been pouring over the telemetry and usually three hours later or so, suddenly it pops up in your alert queue. Now, in your mind, picture the attack test running. There's two attack VMs and there's three target systems. Those target systems are not production systems. So what this means is the services on the back end, human beings, stared at all the telemetry coming in and massively crunched to figure it out. That's not a real world scenario. So it might be the first type of delay where there's a batch process, fine. It might also be the second time where the second kind where it, it really somebody behind the scenes is, 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 is toying with the system and that isn't reliable long term. The second kind of modifier is a configuration change. This is not a, a good thing. Uh, it means that more than just throwing an alert, somebody actually changed the running system during the tests. MITRE doesn't come out and say this, but I interpret this to mean they think someone's cheating. Um, and then the final one, final one is tainted. And while that sounds bad, it isn't. Um, one vendor um, amusingly and embarrassingly blogged about how they were, quote, the only vendor to not have any tainted scores, exclamation point, and unquote, as if that was a good thing. Um, tainted actually means inheritance in an object-oriented model. It means I know that something 
is bad because it's connected to and derivative from something else that's bad. And so it becomes a coloring of things adjacent. So if you have telemetry and you have perhaps no, no detection that something is bad, but you can see that it has consequences and is, it can be derived from something that is known to be bad. And I'll show examples of that. So uh, let's have a look at an example of telemetry in particular. Um, for this example, I'm going to try and demonstrate um, the importance of telemetry by clicking through and showing you in our tool. Here, this is our Malop inbox. <clears throat> this is uh, an example of the uh, just explorer.exe. Um, and uh, I've singled it out, and I'll, I'll click on that here. And this opens up our screen um, to, to analyze what, what you're seeing. Um, this is when you use our tool, if you, if you click on anything in that malop or, or malicious operation inbox, it pops up a window like this one. Um, so we've taken an instance of explorer.exe, and you'll see that it is effectively loading an unusual module, um, which was later enriched um, and called out as meterpreter, if you look up here at the top center. Um, so it says there's the, there's the red wheels, and it points up to the right, so this process has loaded a meterpreter agent. Um, if we go to the, if we go down here and I click further, um, you can see a timeline of the event. And you can see the reason for this is that the process itself is hosting an injected piece of code, which is indicative of a defensive uh, evasion, as well as executing a module that is reflexively loaded into the memory space. It's a standard technique um, that's used. And in, in fact, here you can see there's an attack flag that we've put in here because we've identified uh, the injected thread is probably part of a defense in defense evasion process if you look at the bottom the telemetry in this case is uh, modules that exist in memory right so that's been recorded and they're written into the memory space of the process but never touch the disk so they live in memory and if i click a little bit further then you'll see if we scroll down uh, that there that we have access to a list and um, here i can actually search and see if i search on float uh, we can see that uh, some essential things here, like um, here there, there's a module that's doing screenshots. Um, we're also seeing some key logging. And really, this kind of telemetry, it helps an incident responder understand, so what's the impact this might have? And here, this would be something that would be used for something like credential gathering or identity compromise. So this is an example of, of telemetry. Uh, I'm also going to do an, an, a slightly different example, this one around specific behavioral detection. Um, so if I... I click here, we're back in the malware inbox. Um, we define specific behavior as a technology's ability to proactively alert um, the, the security operations center or analysts to a hacker's behavior, but call out specific details on technique and what they're trying to achieve as a tactic. Again, back in the malop inbox, this is from the APT3 scenario. So this is actually from data directly during the, uh, the MITRE attack uh, running system. Uh, and it, and this is um, it, this actual this persistence is built into a legitimate tool, Magnify.exe. Magnify.exe is what's used uh, in Windows when you want to expand something and make it larger. It's also part of the um, the uh, accessibility uh, feature set, which is very important for people who have disabilities around vision. And so it's it's a perfectly normal thing to find in a system. So this specific behavior alert um, around uh, really went after Magnify.exe to masquerade an attacker's tool as a legitimate Windows feature tool. So it actually says masquerading up at the top under magnify.exe as a Windows accessibility feature. And so it replaced the original magnify.exe to gain persistence on that system. And we can see the impacted resources here um, or machines and the users. So you can find where else does this exist and what systems is this uh, associated with uh, quite easily and readily jumping around. And uh, going just one level deeper, if I go down a bit, we can, uh, the, the timeline, the goal is um, here is the timeline is supposed to bring the analyst up to speed, let them see what's happening, but also why it's happening and let them take action effectively. So that's two examples, one of telemetry and one of um, a specific behavior. And I'll, I'll later wrap this up with another example uh, as well. But um, looking at archetypes, um, let's look at three companies. Um, I'm not gonna name two of them. I will name the third one because it's us. Um, but here's a way of looking at one of those campaigns. And the legend lower left, we've color coded. Um, for those who might be uh, have color issues, I probably should have chosen green and red. Um, but uh, the bottom one, no visibility is gray. The next one up is black, telemetry, and then tainted, and then behavioral detection. The later ones supersede the earlier ones. But here's an example of, an, of 
a product that um, had very little taint, meaning very little correlation or coloring, um, and very little alerts except late in the sequence. So if you picture a kill chain in your head, the later you catch something, the more to the right, the less likely you are to be able to wrap it up and deal with it. Um, so it, it has great telemetry for doing hunting. This would be a good investigative tool. Might complement perhaps a large shop with a, with a, a strong uh, set of tools like SIM tools, for instance. Um, I wouldn't be using this as a primary detection mechanism, but as a go-to system of record to understand uh, what's happening, it's a good one to use. And so here's an example of one. Um, the next one is slightly different. This one is, there's a lot of tainted telemetry, meaning connections and correlations happening, but there's only one actual serious detection. So this would not be a good hunting tool. Uh, it didn't have very much telemetry, but it was able to color what was being seen from an initial infection and say, there are connections through here. Uh, the third one is, is ours at Cyber Reason. And in this case, is, is multi-use. Um, everything here, we actually had the, the uh, second uh, best score for telemetry collection. Um, everything here had telemetry under the hood. I just superseded it with a, with a dominant higher color. But you see there's lots of connections, lots of detections happening at each stage of, of the attack, um, and lots of coloring going through. So this is a multi-use case uh, example. And so let, let's look at a, uh, try and bring this all together um, with, a, with a tangible example. So. Um, we um, let's let's so we talked about many different results from attack testing, things like telemetry and specific behavior, taint, enhancement, and what have you. So we got to try and identify what's happening, and then we're going to try and guide and, and take action. So I'm going to pick a malop. In this case, it's SVC host .exe. Um, we're, this is a, a again a legitimate Windows process. It's performing privilege escalation on a specific machine. And the alert was also enriched, and that's a key word here, because you can see it says Cobalt Strike Beacon. That's information brought to it um, and then usable uh, as well. So if I drill into that, um, you know, if I click on the, on the alert, we can see the telemetry that shows the affected user again. In this case, Debbie. Um, I don't know who Debbie is because I think she's fictional uh, and populated in the system and the machine, as well as the timeline and the techniques that are used. And enrichment shows up here at the top and flagged as Cobalt Strike Beacon again, this time uh, not in Magnify, but in SVC Host. And if I then scroll down again, the attackers, you can see they're leveraging SVC Host uh, to escalate privileges, but it's also looking to evade detection. So you see under suspicions, it says elevating privileges, attack privilege escalation, and the flag there where that falls as a tactic in the uh, attack framework, but also malicious executable, which was reflectively loaded, much like we saw before, um, and so that is defensive agent and privilege and escalation through process injection as well. And if I continue here and scroll way down, because this goes down to the next section, then I can, the next question is what's happening with this attack? Um, this is what taint is about, right? And so I mentioned taint, now I'm actually gonna demonstrate it. So if I scroll through and you see the process uh, profile over here on the left, um, that's that section in the left margin, and we drill into the attack tree, um, now you get a very useful tool, which is to see what the provenance of any particular running process is. What's its parent, what are its children? And you'll notice that some of these are in red, showing the taint, the connection within the system. This is within Cyber Reasons tool. Um, so this taint is, as I said, this notion of inheritance, and it follows this red path. That helps the analyst focus on what really matters and also helps them understand context. Um, this, uh, this one triggered on SVC host, but the parent process is CMD. Uh, .exe, and that therefore inherits the taint as well, going up the tree. And if we go higher, it also it also tainted explorer.exe, and so we're following this path. And if we highlight explorer, we see in the suspicions over on the right now, in the right margin, um, we see that this actually was related to something called resume viewer. And this chain of events, in other words, is starting to form a story. We can begin to see what's happening and how a particular um, detection is laterally connected and within the system, how it got to where it is and perhaps what happened before and afterwards. And this, the question then becomes, what else happened as a result of, of a resume viewer? We, you know, what else is it doing? And if I scroll down in the attack tree further, I can pivot and see that it's running run DLL 32.exe uh, as a host process for another piece of the attack. And I can then go a little bit deeper and following the taint now around run DLL32, it's injecting pieces of shellcode into another child process. 
Another piece of enrichment that is interesting to, to an analyst is the blue portion on the right, uh, which I've highlighted under evidence. This is a communication over RDP. And now we can leverage the telemetry recorded by the system, which didn't have taint associated with it. But because the data is there, I can now pivot and say, show me the machine. Now, keep in mind, this is from the running system um, that was used during the attack evaluation. So it is on a 10 unroutable network, but that's fine. You, you, the point was, even though it was a staged attack, we can now see quite a bit. So we can see which machines are connecting using this. And at this point, we can conclude we're looking at lateral movement right, over RDP between systems in the same environment. And from here, we can pivot to an investigation, ask questions quickly in the environment, piece together a whole story. And finally, we can move to remediation at this point, because remember the OODA loop goal is to go from initially having some observation or detection and to be able to rapidly understand and orient, then to make a decision about what to do and take action and be able to, to, be able to clean this off. So, with that, I've shown a little bit of the telemetry through our system because every system will show it a little differently. Let's talk a bit about cyber reason results and then we'll move on to a Q&A. <clears throat> so the attack coverage, uh, cyber reason had the highest coverage of those tested at 78% of the detections. Um, one I'm particularly proud of is correlation. This is this notion of taint. Uh, correlation is perhaps a more common and older term for it, but how do things get connected? And if you look, um, <clears throat> I'll show you in a minute, if you look at um, how many alerts it took to detect techniques and how they were constructed as a story is, is a vital point. Um, now, real-time cyber reason had no delayed results and we had no config changes, um, which is very good. So the real-time alerts were highest. Um, everything that we show is, I should say, from a physics perspective, it's close to real-time. There were no delays though in the system. And here's our results for real-time alerts. And in this category, this is a breakdown by tactic. In other words, by I should say by categories. So um, at what stage of the kill chain, from initial compromise through execution of persistence in the environment, what coverage did Cyber Reason get in each category? And then what degree of correlation existed? For instance, in one of these categories, there was over 30 detections to be found. In our inbox, they were all found and highlighted with only three alerts because they were connected into a story. That degree of correlation made it much more manageable. It wasn't 30 elements in a sea of false positives, let's say just these systems, it might have been hundreds. Instead, it was a malop inbox with three things. And when you clicked on them, the sequence and the connectivity and the correlation or taint was able to make this understandable as a story and resolvable by people people actually trying to stop bad things happening. What's more is it was done in a way that's accessible to general technologists for communication and decision making. So um, our focus before I wrap up on the attack overall, um, now we put the defender in the center. I think the detections serve to provide an understanding so the defenders can be ready to act, right? That OODA loop. The emphasis should be on shrinking time. And the goal is to avoid damage it because you've shrunk the time in that decision loop. And I think the evals, uh, here really serve the defender. Um, I think I think it can help us put them back in the center because this what we have to do is make people more efficient overall. But the takeaways from the attack framework, I would say there are no scores or rankings. For all that I I did interpretation post facto on the data that was provided by MITRE, MITRE itself made no judgments and didn't do any rankings. And I would encourage you to go to the data. Don't listen to any vendor's claims, myself included. Instead, go through and understand the data. It's published in a JSON format. The attackeval.mitre.org by vendor puts information out there and it breaks it down in very readable fashions with screenshots of how every product did or didn't find something. No one was perfect here, but pay attention to things like detection types and modifiers and those screenshots on the website. In particular, the delayed tags the config changes tags and the taint tags really matter. So this is very useful for unbiased technical insight into product capabilities, but also into your programs. You don't need any EDR program uh, products to be evaluated to take advantage of the MITRE ATT&CK framework and say, how would we do? And a lot of folks talk about red teaming. Could I take the library and just run a red team? Most red teams know how to run attacks. Yes, they can use it, but much more interesting is purple teaming. And I mean, sitting down with an attacker side by side with a defender and hit the button that says, I'm running the next test. Did you see it? How did you see it? How might, would you have noticed it? That kind of initial baselining is far more valuable than a grab the flag. Uh, I'm reminded of a basketball game 
if you've ever watched basketball, <clears throat> every basket is worth two points. And the, the score for the game will run 100 to 200 points. If I were to pick any one play and say, how did, the, how did the, this play go down and judge the defending team based on what an attacking team did in scoring a basket, um, I wouldn't be able to tell much about who was the best player, who won the game. And one of the problems with red teaming is, yes, somebody gets a kudos and, yes, it can highlight issues, but it's very much like that one basket in an entire basketball game. Purple teaming is more interesting, and it's extremely useful for self-assessments. And so I encourage you to go to the website. It's all publicly available general knowledge, and hopefully will lead to some fundamental differences in how we see the art of advanced detection and response and turn it into a science and let us all build on it. So with that, Alistair, I, uh, I've run through the formal portion of the program. Uh, back to you to, to, to field some Q&A. Great stuff, Sam. Thank you very much indeed. Um, right, we do have some questions. Just before um, I go to those, just to uh, let the delegates know that we will be sending you a link to the recording of this session. So um, you know, the notes you've been scribbling furiously down, we'll be able to augment those. Right, okay, let's have a look at the questions. We do have a few. Sam, I think some people have been Googling you. We've got a Forbes question. We'll come to that in a second. Right. Um, okay, Sam, you said that Cyber Reason didn't use services. Does that mean you don't have them, need them, want them? Are they relevant? No, not, not at all. We, we didn't use them um, in the test. Uh, we felt EDR should stand up as it is. I think we were the only vendor that didn't use services or people behind the scenes. But we absolutely have. Uh, we, I call it, uh, well, it's called MDR, uh, but really I call it managed EDR, and other services, um, you know, like advanced analytics and hunting and what have you, to up-level uh, our partners and customers. But we didn't use them in the test. We do have them. Okay. Um, there's a question about red teaming, but I think you kind of, I think the question came up before you actually covered the topic, and I think you kind of covered it when you talked about uh, so we'll, we'll pass on that one. Um, do you think others will start using the framework for other tests and proof of concepts? Yeah, I, I, I really hope they do. Uh, I think it started happening already to some degree. There's a, an increase in the general knowledge I mentioned uh, uh, from my, my talks last week. Uh, I heard people talking about um, in some pretty wonderful ways, but I think people can and should build on it. Uh, I know Minder would probably welcome that. Um, I had a, a question at a lunch seminar I did yesterday uh, where someone says, how does one go about doing this? And I'm sure we'll start to see consulting offerings around it too. But mind of themselves are going to run a round two. And I think they're going to, I think they've announced they're going to do APT29, which is code for Cozy Bear, uh, one of the Russian um, um, advanced attackers, which means they'll cover uh, the last tactic that they didn't do, which was the very first one in the, in the kill sequence. And they'll do much more, many more techniques going forward. I also wouldn't be surprised if they themselves started or others started to apply these tests to things like network detection, uh, which tends to cut things later in the cycle, or SIM, uh, because SIM has tried to help here and really failed over the years. So I expect we'll see a lot more about it. Also. Okay, great. Um, I think this is a person must have Googled you and gone on to Forbes while you were talking. Um, and they've just said, I've read your blog on Forbes and you didn't mention your results. Why was that? Uh, well, uh, I, I write on Forbes from a completely neutral perspective uh, and the voice of a CISO. Um, but I, I believe all vendors really do have good solutions. Um, I think they all have different applicability based on, on what a given practitioner's needs are. Um, but it's on webinars like this where I, I can put on my cyber reason hat and, and speak a little bit about our results. So you've got a, this webinar has a combination of my, my public neutral CISO perspective and my employee of cyber proudly sharing our results perspective so hope that makes sense okay great and actually a note for everyone else on the call sam's um, blogs on forbes are excellent and i absolutely uh, encourage you to go and read them um i think this actually will for i think this will be um, the best last question coming up because it's quite general and i think it gives you um the chance to summarize a few points um what do you think is the most important point about the framework and how to interpret it um well the most important thing i'd say is go to the data um you know i've seen bad vendor behavior uh, as people tout their scores um, it's fine to be proud of your results, but yeah, some of the blogs out there are not tied to the data that actually is about them. 
So go to the data, make sure that you understand it and the framework, it's very approachable. Trust no interpretations, I even include my own in that. Um, you know, this is all verifiable, trust but verify. Uh, so for a really good way to analyze the data, by the way, I recommend Josh Zalonis of Forrester's blog. He's done a fantastic job of really trying to find ways of assessing it. Remember, he does want to come up with a list and he's going to produce a wave, but he's actually put some scripts and Python scripts on Git that you can download and you can run through it and he's explained his rationale and it does output a score and that rationale, if it's useful to you, does get you somewhere interesting and you can use that model. Um, and I think, um, his, I like his kill chain script in particular. It's all digestible, it's all free and now the research is out there and we can build on it. So the most important thing, guys, is go to the data. Okay, fabulous. Okay, great. I think that is where we will wrap it up. So, Sam, thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you to uh, the delegates. And again, a reminder, we will be sending you a link to the recording. So uh, thank you and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.